I want to welcome everyone to the first uh, meeting of this season for the Gloucester County Nature Club. Our meeting uh, tonight is a very special one. It is a truly international meeting being brought to you live from Argentina uh, by Mr. <clears throat> Marcelo Gavinsky, uh, who is the creator, director, and main tour leader for Birds Argentina. And <clears throat> Uh, Marcelo uh, grew up in a small town in Buenos Aires province in what we call the Pampas, uh, the grasslands, uh, and got his first binocular at the age of 10. He started birding then and then and honed his skills uh, at a very young age. He not only is an expert at birds birding by sight, but also uh, recognizing bird calls and bird songs. Uh, he's had extensive experience uh, birding in all of the echo provinces uh, echo regions of Argentina. And Argentina is a remarkably diverse place uh, in terms of natural habitats with over a thousand bird species found there. Uh, he's also birded in most of the, the South American nations and also in Africa and in, in the Middle East. He's worked on biological research projects and also was a guide for the Argentine Museum of Natural History. About 11 years ago, in 2010, Marcelo decided to found his own tour, touring company Echo Touring uh, Company for Birding, and he founded Birding Buenos Aires, which later grew and matured into the company he runs today with a staff of extraordinarily uh, uh, talented uh, and knowledgeable guides, and that's Birds Argentina. Uh, he has uh, taken uh, international groups of people on, on tours throughout his nation and has uh, guided tours with such people as Noah Stryker and David Sibley. And now I'd like you all to give a very warm welcome across the hemispheres to Marcelo Gavetsky and Birding Argentina. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for that presentation. Um, thanks again also for inviting me. It's a, it's a real pleasure for me. And it's the first time I do this. Uh, I mean, I have given presentations, lectures, like the one I'm going to give right now, but always, uh, at uh, international bird fairs, but never like this, never to like a specific group of people from a specific place. So thanks a lot again. And let me just uh, start sharing my screen and the presentation. I hope you understand me <laughs> uh, some words. Maybe, you know, because of this pandemic, last time I guided someone in English was last year's uh, March. So it's been a long time and, you know, like, like many things uh, to speak language is practice, to practice it the most you can. So I hope you, you understand me. And if you don't uh, understand any word or, I mean, any, if, you, if you need to ask me to repeat it, I will do it gladly. So thanks again. <laughs> I think the uh, presentation and the, the, the description of my background was very, uh, very complete. So I will skip uh, one slide that I had about that. But just I would like to, to tell you that this lecture will be about birding in Argentina. So, but um, I would like to give you um, an idea of what is to come to Argentina and bird watch here. Um, where to go, which birds would you expect and what to do if you're planning to come here. So I've been doing this and guiding people for over 10 years now. And well, well, this is basically, I think, you know it already because of the, the introduction you had. So, but now the brand, uh, the, sorry, the company I'm using for this lecture is Bird in Buenos Aires, because it's the one, it's a, it's a website that you can find. You'll find a lot of this information I will share with you today. And that's how I look like when I'm guiding <laughs> with my spotting scope on my binoculars. So, but first I wanted to, to show you where exactly is Argentina? Because maybe some of you, I don't know if any of you have been to Argentina or to South America or at least to, or maybe Southern South America. But if you haven't, well, Argentina is this country here in green, <laughs> dark green is the, is together with Chile, they're the southernmost countries in South America. In fact, Chile gets a little bit uh, southern 
I mean, even further south. Um, but it's it's a very slight difference. And well, here you will see this map includes the Antarctic Peninsula and some south, southwest Atlantic island, but, but these territories in dispute. But in Argentina, I mean, in our official maps, it, it appears, I mean, we learned that, well, this part of Antarctica is part of Argentina, etc. cetera. But uh, the, the Argentina is not the only country with a claim on Antarctica. In fact, there are many countries and we share well, the same area that we claim is also claimed by Chile and by the UK, the United Kingdom. So yeah, it's a bit of a mess, but I wanted to show you where we are and give you just a little bit of information about, well, Argentina in numbers. So I decided to, to just write down these uh, uh, slides. Like one, the first number I would like to share with you is, the, is that Argentina is the eighth largest country in the world. Uh, it's, it is the largest Spanish speaking country and the second largest country in South America. I think I mean, this information I'm, I'm sharing with you is because I think it might be a little bit uh, or important enough for you if you're planning to come to Argentina because for, let's say, if you want to organize a trip in Argentina, you have to know that Argentina is a very large country and it's hard to just go birding and try to go everywhere in, in one trip. It's very hard, if not impossible. But yes, yeah, so this is the, the first thing. Uh, just to give you an idea, in miles, uh, this 2,263 miles in straight line between the northernmost and southernmost cities. I have looked for, for information in the internet, and I found, and I'm, I found that it's a bit. It is similar to the distance between the states of New York and California. So I hope this gives you uh, an idea of how big is the country where I live. But in terms of population, it's not that big. In fact, it is not the, the most populated Spanish country, not, not even in South America. I think Colombia has a bit more people than Argentina. But we are about 45 million people and 15 of them, or 15 of us, <laughs> are living in Buenos Aires metropolis. So this is a very centralized country. I also thought this might be helpful for you because if you're coming to Argentina, you probably or very likely arrive first in Buenos Aires because this is where the main international airport is. And then people from Buenos Aires travel to the other corners of the country that they wish to visit. Argentina is also, this is an interesting uh, number. We are the third country in the Americas, I mean, from North America to South America, with largest number of immigrants. I'm talking about people now. Uh, after the US and Canada, we are the third country, and this is a current number. So this is because there's a, still a lot, of, a lot of migration going on in the world. But also it's a historical fact because you know, Argentina has a, Look, it's 85 of the population in Argentina has European ancestry. And interesting, we are the main, uh, let's say, main country uh, from where people came was Italy, not Spain. I mean, we speak Spanish because this was a, a Spanish colony. But um, if you look for the last names, most, I mean, the yeah, most last names would be Italian. And then the second most would be Spanish and French, German, British, and many others. Uh, so this is interesting also because we, uh, we the, the way we speak is different. Like if you've been to, to Mexico, you, you, don't, you shouldn't expect that we speak like them because we have a different accent. In fact, it's the accent here in Buenos Aires and surroundings is more, similar to Italian than to, than, than to Mexican Spanish. It is also, in terms of food and other things, uh, it, it has a lot of um, uh, I mean, influence from these Spanish, uh, sorry, Spanish, European countries. Uh, there is also a lot of people with uh, Native American ancestry, uh, but uh, the majority has European ancestry. And another number, which is sad, but I also wanted to share with you is that 36.1 is the accumulated inflation rate last year. So 
our local currency is very weak and many prices are quoted in US dollars. This is also important if you're planning a trip to Argentina because you will see many of us give our quotes in US dollars, not in our local currency. We Then we can take, of course, payment in a local currency because that is by law, we have to and, and we, we, we do it. But in t if we use just the local currency, we would need to to update the price almost every week. Sad. This is very sad, and it's also a historical thing in Argentina. It is not an, an exception uh, in our history. So these are Argentina in numbers, uh, mm -hmm. but about size, people, and economy. But I, I wanted to share with you other numbers that might be more important for you and it's in terms of birds and nature so our list of birds is a thousand and seventy six bird species and it's increasing because every year well maybe a new bird is found a new vagrant this is this number includes migrants and vagrants and residents it's all the birds and also there are new splits so yeah it's uh, increasing this represents approximately 10% of the world's birds, so it's a big number. But in, our, in South America, we are, we are the seventh country in, I mean, in the ranking of countries with the most uh, number of bird species. This is because South America is the, con the continent or subcontinent of birds. It has more bird species than any other continent. So uh, we are seventh, but after uh, six countries that have Amazon forest, we don't have Amazon forest. We have other interesting subtropical forests, but not the Amazon. So, uh, but it still is a good number. Then we have at least th uh, 13 endemic bird species and up to 20. This difference has to do with, uh, in one hand, also, I showed you that we have a claim in some <laughs> Southwest Atlantic islands. So if you include a couple of uh, those endemic birds, then they would be part of an Argentinian endemic uh, bird list. But also because there are some recent splits that have not been completely recognized. And there were some, there are also a few lumps that, Anyway, so we have between 13 and 20 endemic bird species. So, so birds that you won't find anywhere else in the world. We have 16 ecoregions and we have the second largest basin in South America. It is La Plata or River Plate. This is after the Amazon, which is the world's largest basin. It's, uh, you, you can't compare the Amazon with any other basin, but the second largest in South America, we have it here in Argentina, and it also affects very much the biodiversity in our country. And we have the first or the longest mountain range in the world, which is the Andes. And we, in Argentina, we have the highest peak outside the Himalayas, the Aconcagua Mount. It's uh, 22,841 feet. So that's very, very high. So this is, sorry, I, I didn't um, add any any picture, but from now on, we'll, I will start sharing pictures first uh, of our country, I mean, Argentina with the different ecoregions, because this is important to understand because the biodiversity is al always affected or influenced by the ecoregions. So a country with more ecoregions has more bird of another animals, more species, let's say. So in this map, I hope you can see the uh, my the arrow here. Uh, you, you can see all these different colors. Each one of them represents one ecoregion. So we have 16, as I mentioned. And these ecoregions include subtropical forest of Amazon domain. I, I said we don't have Amazon forest, but we have subtropical forests that are related uh, to the Amazon. Uh, they're not uh, the Amazon, but they are somehow related. Maybe in, in, pre in prehistorical times they were connected. So some species can be found even in these other forests that are not the Amazon. And we also have zero, zero forests 
and Palm Savannah, so the Chaco domain, another important domain in South America. We have temperate forests of Antarctic domain. This is the Patagonian forest, which is in this map, it's a very narrow, um, I think it's green or gray green line right here in the border with Chile. It's interesting that it's uh, from the Antarctic domain, but this is because the forest itself, the, I mean, many trees are related to trees and forests of uh, Tasmania and New Zealand that were connected with South America in prehistorical times through Antarctica. So these forests have nothing to do with the rest of South American forests. This is interesting because all it also, if you visit Patagonia, you will see most of the birds are not found anywhere else in, in South America. We have high elevation forests, polylepis, we have very large wetlands, Ibera Marsh, uh, well, Paraná Delta, well, the Puna wetlands. We have sub subtropical and temperate grasslands, the Pampas and the Campos. Here, the green, dark green in the center, these are the Pampas grasslands. Well, they used to be because now it, most of it is agricultural land, but we still have a few patches of well-preserved grasslands. We have semi-deserts uh, or or true deserts, we could say, of some of them. We have steppes, and we have the high Andes peaks. All of that in this country. So let's start, let's do this like if you were coming to Argentina. So you would be first arrived in Buenos Aires. This, uh, this little dot is where Buenos Aires city is located. Buenos Aires is the capital of the country. And um, well, this is where I live and where I guide the most. Um, and most of most times, the, the visitors do not think of Buenos Aires as a birding destination. I mean, when they start planning their trip to to Argentina, they think of other destinations, but they have to go through Buenos Aires, and then they start looking for information about birding in Buenos Aires, and they find out that it's a great destination. That's what I want to show you here in the next few uh, slides. So when you arrive in Buenos Aires, um, one of the first things you uh, you can do is to visit one of our urban reserves, especially this one, which is called Costanera Sur Reserve. It's very near downtown. You can go walking from downtown. It's ten blocks, and it's uh, it's incredible because it's a big park. It's three hundred uh, about three hundred hectares. I, sorry, I don't I don't know how many acres that would be, but but it's big and um, it has over 200 species of birds. But another thing which is very good for birding is that this park is very is heavily visited, but not just by bird watchers. In fact, most of the visitors are just runners or bikers or people who go there for a picnic. So birds are very used to having people around and they are tame. You can have very good views of them from very close distance and get great pictures. One of the first birds you would find in this park and in many other parks and squares in Buenos Aires is this one. I wanted to, to start the presentation, I mean, to be, I wanted this species to be the first bird because it's also our national bird, the Rufus hornero. It looks a bit like a thrush, but it, it, but it is not. In fact, it's, it's, part of, it's a member of a family that is only found in the neotropics, the, the Furnarids, and Ornero, it's Spanish for oven maker because they make these nests. This is its nest and it's amazing. It's big and heavy and they only use it once. And they, they build all this and then use it once and leave it. And they, then they build a new one and another one. So they're also important birds for other species because the old, the abandoned nests are used by many other bird species. So this is something you will find here in Buenos Aires and it's very common. But then there are other birds that maybe for the for the twitchers would be more more attractive than a, than a very common bird. And this is one example, the southern screamer. Screamers, that's another thing. If you haven't been to South America, you'll find that we have many different families that are not found in North America or in Europe or in other parts of the world. That's because South America used to be separated from North America for millions of years. So it was a 
like Australia, <laughs> and many uh, birds and other fauna evolved uh, isolated, uh, yes, isolated from the rest of the world's fauna. So this is a family that is only found in South America, the screamers, with only three species, and we have southern screamer. It's big, it's a huge bird, and they're related to ducks and geese. But you also could see this species, the black-necked swan, which is the only true swan in South America, beautiful and big. We also have another swan, but it's not a real swan. We call it Coscoroba, and it just resembles a swan, but it's more related to geese. But let's say if, if you go out of Buenos Aires, you want to go to the fields, then birding gets even more attractive. One destination I recommend very much is southern Entre Rios. Entre Rios is the name of a province, which is right above Buenos Aires, I mean, north of Buenos Aires. And in uh, just one and a half hours uh, driving north, you can get to this region and see many other attractive species. You could see this one, the giant wood rail. Uh, we have many species of rails and wood rails. We have three in Argentina and they are big rails. Giant wood rail is the largest of all. And they're easy to see. I mean, compared to traditional rails, they are not reclusive, they just they <laughs> just run around, it may be sometimes in the open field. But there are also other species that are uh, attractive uh, to most people because of they are like unique. Um, I mean, I mean, or maybe they're a symbol of the, of the region, like the greater rhea. Rheas are related to ostriches. <clears throat> and in South America, well, they're, they only uh, live in South America. And we have two to three species, depending on who you follow, which uh, classification committee you follow. And we have all of them. Um, and this is the largest, the greater rhea. And you can see it, especially, of course, outside of, of the city, in places with not mm, too many people living around. They don't like when there's too, mm, too many people, like too much uh, density of population. And they're huge, they're flightless, they run very fast. Well, I, I really like uh, greater areas. But I also, uh, I mentioned that I wanted to show you a couple of birds that we share because uh, they, in fact, they breed in North America and they come south to Argentina, the Pampas, also Uruguay and Southern Brazil for our summer. So in your, during your winter, they are here and they are also, they are great and attractive for us and also for international travelers because sometimes they, they could be easier to see here than in, in their breeding grounds or in, on in that region. So Upland sandpiper is one of them. And another one is Swainson's hawk. We have many others, especially waders. We have lots of waders that migrate from Northern North America to so Southern South America. But well, Swainson's hawks are great when they come. This is one of a few species that we see flocking like in huge flocks. Most of the other migrant, migratory bird species, we, we don't see them all together like we do with Swainson's hawk. Other raptors, we have many raptors in Argentina, but another one that you can see in Southern Entre Rios is this one, Savanna hawk, it's beautiful. And it's quite common. This is the southernmost uh, place where you can see it. They like the places that look like savannas, like the um, ecosystem right there in Southern Entre Rios. Then we have Espinal forest, which is a kind of uh, serophytic forest and with some specialties like white fronted woodpecker. This is a Milanirpis, is related to acorn woodpecker and other woodpeckers that you see in North America. But this one is, is endemic to this region. We share it with, with bordering countries, but it's mainly found in Argentina. In the same habitat, you would find this one, scimitar billed wood creeper, which is amazing. Is one of the largest wood creepers, and it also behaves uh, different, differently compared to other wood creepers because they do use the ground a lot, and they resemble if you have ever been to Europe or Africa or parts of Asia, they resemble the hoopoe when you see it walking on the ground, but they're not, of course. And many nocturnal birds, if you like uh, nocturnal birding or owling, 
uh, well, we have many owls and night jars like this one, which is great, the scissor tail night jar. It's quite common here during the, the summer. <clears throat> it's a migratory bird. Others are the South American painted, painted knives. Um, this is a really a very much targeted bird species by most of our, the travelers who come to Argentina, but they're hard to spot because there's, they're very much nocturnal, but sometimes they're active during the day, but they're very random. So it's not that you can go to the same place and see it every time. But if you look for it, you may find it, especially if you're with a guy, we're a good guy. Other birds of the area, uh, these are more like, uh, how do you call it? Like little brown jobs. <laughs> They're small brownish birds, mainly interesting for really uh, real hardcore birders like Hudson's Canastero, straight billed red hunter, and uh, more uh, attractive also in terms of the plumage is the marsh seed eater. Um, and the, um, it's an endangered species found in the summer here in in the marshes of southern Entre Rios. It's, uh, it's very uncommon. I mean, the population is small, so you have to, to know exactly where to go and see it. So that's just to give you an idea of what Buenos Aires has to offer if you're coming to Argentina. But from here, I would recommend you to start going north. You can do all this in different um, ways and you don't need to, to follow this uh, order but um if you go if we were here in the where the white arrow is but now to go to ibera marsh which is this light green area you you have to travel north and then you'll find this kind of habitat that includes marsh uh, forests and grasslands and this is further north so it's also warmer especially during the the summer because in winter with the Southern wind can travel all the way to central Brazil sometimes. So winter can be cold in all of Argentina if you are in a, in a well, depending on the, on the week because it's not even, like some weeks are colder than others. But in the summer, this area is hotter than, warmer than Buenos Aires. And here, this is a place that you have to visit if you want to see my, or one of my favorite bird species of Argentina, which is the strange tailed tyrant. This is the, the the bird that was on the first slide. So I didn't want to repeat the same photograph, so I used this other one. But the first one was even better. It's a beautiful bird. It's, it is very small. And it's uh, both uh, endangered and almost endemic. We share it with, mainly with, uh, with Paraguay. And sometimes they show up in a few spots in Brazil. So this is a bird that you have to look for in that area, especially in humid grasslands. In the um, Ibera marsh itself, you may see these other species. In the summer, especially, we have lots of seed eaters that uh, are, they come, most of our summer visiting species, they breed in Argentina. And then in our winter, they travel further north. So this is a, Possibly an endemic breeder. I say possible because possibly because this is a recently described species. So we still don't know much about it, but it's called Ibera seed eater uh, after the Ibera marsh. Also black and white monjita. In Argentina, we have all the monjitas. Monjitas are tyrants, so they're related to to the to kingbirds, like um, and, and other birds that you will you see in, in and flycatchers from North America. But um, the name monjita comes after the word in Spanish, monja, which is uh, Spanish for nun. Monjita is little nun because a few of them, uh, of a few of these species are white, or at least uh, par partly like, like this species, which is endangered. Also, the jabiru, the largest stork in the Americas, is huge and it's a great bird to see. You can find this bird all, all over South America and in parts of Central America, but it's great to see it anywhere you go. And um, the sharp-tailed tyrant, this is a bird from, the, from a different kind of grassland, 
which is endangered. Sadly, many grassland specialties are endangered mainly due to habitat loss um, because of the change of use. Uh, in Argentina, we still have a lot of uh, grass feeding cattle, but um, some, in some regions that is being um, changed by other uses like pine plantations. So they're losing the grassland for pines and all, any of these birds can survive in a pine plantation. That's not where they, the place where they evolved. But we still have places where you can go and see this beauty and also this critically endangered species, saffron called blackbird. Uh, sadly, this is a, it is every year we see fewer and fewer. So we, this might be one of the birds that if you ever want to see it, you should come <laughs> to Argentina or Uruguay or parts of uh, Brazil uh, soon because, uh, well, they're not doing well. Another species which is endangered is yellow cardinal and this beautiful. And sadly for this species, their, their main problem is that they're very pretty and their song is very complex and, and nice. And in the region, we still have many people who like keeping birds in cages. So these birds are disappearing for because of that trapping just to keep them in cages they are protected legally protected so no one can sell them or trap them but well we need more enforcement of the law but uh, well ibera marsh and the forests surrounding ibera are the best to see these species the yellow cardinal other animals i mean the ibera marsh are, is is great not just for birding if you like uh, like a safari and watching all kinds of animals, you can see this black holer. Well, the name is weird, but this is because males are black. This is a female. You have this, and uh, you can see two species of caimans. This is one of them, the yacare caiman. You can also see marsh deer. You can see anacondas, yellow anacondas, and many other animals which are tame. So it's a very nice place if you like that kind of uh, nature watching. The next destination I would recommend recommend you to go is the Paraná Forest and Iguazu Falls. You may recognize this uh, this falls. If you not, I will show you a picture. But I wanted to show you first in this map how close this uh, habitat is to the Ibera Marsh. So this is very easy to connect to go and visit the forest in one uh, the first half of the trip and then the marsh or the or the other way back. Um, so let's see what uh, this forest has to offer and the falls. First of all, this is a subtropical forest of Amazon domain. So it is related with the Amazon, but it's part of the Atlantic forest, which is, um, it is one of the most endangered and biodiverse forests in the world. There were once, this forest was once found all over uh, Eastern Brazil and almost half of Paraguay and this little part of, of Argentina. I will show you the map again so I can show you. So this part of Argentina, this is Misiones province. It was always the only place in Argentina where we had this forest. But this is Paraguay here and they have this forest almost in half of the country. And this is Brazil and they have all this, this forest was all over <laughs> the southern Brazil. Sadly, it has disappeared almost completely from most of the, these bordering countries. But Argentina still preserves big patches of this forest. So it's a great place if you want to see the birds that, that live in this forest, because most of species in the Atlantic forest are endemic. Also, these are the falls. This is just one picture of a huge place. These are not, I mean, the, the falls include many more sorry, falls, it's not just this part, but there are more in the back and there are more like in the back of a photographer. So you cannot have one picture with all Iguazu Falls, but this is an amazing place because it's the, I think every, all falls are great, but these are particularly nice because the, of the natural frame in the national park called Iguazu National Park, it protects the falls and the forest. So here, I don't know if you get to see this, people here. So there are places you can go around and see the falls from very near and also be surrounded by the forest. Over here, there's more people. 
So and in this forest, you will find species that are typically like South American or neotropical species. You can see tokens and tokenets and arasaris. This species is native, sorry, it's endemic to, to this forest, to the Atlantic forest, spot built toucanet. You can see trogons, like Suruqua trogon, also almost endemic to this forest. It's also found in a different one. Mannequins, we have three species of mannequins in that part of Argentina, including this one, which is endemic to Atlantic forest, swallow-tailed mannequin. <clears throat> Colorful tanagers, like green-headed, also endemic. <laughs> to this forest. Some very neat parrots like Vinaceous breasted Amazon, which is endemic to this forest, but also sadly uh, endangered. It is endangered because of loss of habitat loss mainly. But there are places where you can go and see them like, like this. We have ones like black fronted piping one, endangered and endemic. Sorry, sorry I'm laughing, it's, it's, it's sad. But but it's at least we have them there and they're quite well prote protected. So because of the national and provincial parks that are found in that province, these birds have a place where like a shelter <laughs> that I hope they can use um, and survive survive us, so survive the humans. There are many small birds in this forest, of course, and some of them are bamboo specialists because there are also quite a few species of bamboo. This is one of them, the Bertonis antbird, but there are many others. We just chose one, which is also pretty because it's sort of reddish. If you like, again, nightjars and owls, if you remember the scissor-tailed nightjar I showed you a few minutes ago, the tail of a scissor-tailed nightjar was probably as long as this, this uh, up to this point. And it was quite long. But look at the size of this. The long-trained Niger has a very long tail. This is the male, of course. The, the male is the one who has this very long tail. And it's also endemic to the Atlantic forest. You can see also the birds that are not endemic. So they're shared uh, with other forests of South America, including the Amazon or the Choco forest or the uh, other forests in, in the Neotropics. But we have them as well, like black and white hawk eagle. We have all the three hawk eagles. We, we have all the forest eagles of the Neotropics. Some of them are really rare or almost extinct, but we still have them. This one is not that rare. or At least it's... Uh, it's scarce, but they like to soar a lot and very high. So if you if you look up at the right time of the day uh, in that part of Argentina, you have good chances of seeing it. Okay, so from that region, from we were in the northeast, so you can travel to the northwest. In fact, there are uh, flights. I mean, you can connect both places. Like flying from Iguazu, Iguazu town is in right in this spot that I'm trying to show you with the white arrow. So from there, there are pl uh, flights that go all over, all across Argentina to, especially to the province of Salta, which is this one. And from here, you can visit also Jujuy province or Tucumán or Catamarca. These are the provinces of the northwest. But I want you to, to look at this, uh, to see all the different colors that you can find in this region. So this shows you the, the diversity. I didn't mention it, but, uh, but the Paraná forest is the most diverse ecoregion in the country. So as single ecoregions, this one, the Paraná forest was the most diverse. But in the Northwest, you have this combination of ecoregions and all together, make up the the most diverse region in Argentina. I'm not talking about ecoregion, but the region of Argentina. The Northwest is the most uh, diverse, so it's very, very attractive for any bird watcher or nature lover. And it's also very contrasting. I mentioned that we have the Andes range in Argentina, and the Andes go all over from north to south, all along the west of the country, like here. In fact, it's the border between Argentina and Chile. Most of it is the, the highest peaks. 
<clears throat> so from east to west, you also change the elevation. You go from the lowlands to the highlands. And that makes a big difference. And you will see, I, I want to show you a couple of pictures of different ecosystems. You'll find them or ecoregion. This one is the is what we call the Austral Yungas or Bolivian Tucuman Forest is also another name for it. It's a subtropical forest of Amazon domain. And it, at times it, it's sort of a cloud forest and um, it's very humid. This is because the wind mainly comes from the east, from the Atlantic. So as it, as it goes um, um, higher, then the, um, the air gets colder and the humidity condenses and water fall as a rain. And then in the other side of the Andes, but in Chile, there is a desert, which is the, the driest desert in the world. It's the Atacama Desert. This is because most of the humidity stays in the Argentinian side. But this happens in the north. In the south, there is a there is the opposite happening. But I'll tell you when we get there. So uh, from the Austral Yungas, you can just travel uh, not much. I would say in some spots, even less than an hour uh, driving, you can find this very different habitat or ecoregion, the Pripuna Desert. Look how different it is. So this is the other side of the same mountain. <clears throat> so, and there are many other habitats. This is just, these are two photographs I chose to show you uh, how contrasting this region it can be. So from east to west, you first in the lowlands, you will be in the Chaco forest and see, you will get chances of seeing uh, the two species of Cerimas. Cerimas are this one red legged and this other one black legged. This is harder to photograph, <laughs> you can see by the, the quality of this photograph compared to the previous one. So these are the only two surviving species of, of a group that in prehistorical times included the birds of terror or terror birds. Those were huge birds as big as ostriches with large beaks and they were hunters. Maybe you, you might have seen them in a, in a book or in a documentary. Well, that group is almost extinct except for these two species, the red-legged and black-legged Siriema. We in Argentina and um, and uh, Bolivia are the best countries to see both species in one trip. Also, we have uh, puff birds like Chaco or Spotback, depending on who which committee you follow. <laughs> but the, this is a species that you can find in the Chaco lowlands, the Chaco owl as well. It's a beautiful owl. Uh, it's a Strix owl. And uh, well, we have many species, different species of owls in Argentina and also from this genus. But in the Chaco, you, you can look for this one. As you, you start approaching to the, the foothills, then the, the forest gets more humid and, and you can find other birds typical from the subtropical forest like King Vulture and toucans. In the Northwest, we only have one species, this one, Toco toucan, which is also the world's largest toucan. And then in some mountain rivers, you can look for some, <clears throat> some very attractive species like this, the Rufus throated dipper, which is, <clears throat> sorry, I need to drink water. <laughs> Just a moment. <clears throat> this bird is almost endemic to Argentina. We share it with Bolivia. And in the same rivers, many times we find torrent ducks. So this is a species that you can find I think from Colombia to Argentina and Chile. But anyway, it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing bird to see because of the places where they, li they live. They live in the rapids and they, they swim against the current. It's, it's impressive, really impressive. <clears throat> then other birds of that region include this beauty, which to me is the most beautiful hummingbird in the world, <laughs> the red-tailed comet. It's also a large... Uh, bird, I mean, for a, for a hummingbird. Then the bird that you'll, you could see in my background, this is a mountain tanager, Rufus bellied. This is, uh, remember we're going from east to west and we're climbing up the mountains. So 
in the in high altitude forests you can you could find this and some other species which are typical from that uh, ecosystem and then you would get to the puna uh, plains <laughs> which look very different to the forest that i showed you and you might see these other species the puna rhea which is uh, depending again on which committee you follow for some it's a full run it's a full species and for some others it's a subspecies of lesser rhea anyway we have them over there and in that plain we also have high altitude lakes and marshes like this one this is in um, laguna de los pozuelos <clears throat> it's a protected area where you can see three species of flamingos and uh, many species of waders ducks and waterfowl many uh, coots including the horned coot which which is one of the largest and most attractive uh, species of its kind you can see Andean avocets, Andean geese, well, lots of birds. It's really impressive. And remember that you can go from the lush forest to this habitat in, in a few hours. So in one trip, you can combine all that. Then you can still climb up the mountain because the Andes are high and get to some grasslands in the mountains where you can look for some species of canasteros like uh, scribble-tailed which is uh, very striking for its group. They're related to horneros, so they're brownish, but, but they're attractive. And then other birds that are found at high altitude, like uh, red-backed Sierra finch. This bird, you have to be over 4,000 meters above sea level to, to have chances of seeing them. And there are other species that live at that altitude. And one of them is one of the most attractive birds of South America. It's this one, the diademed sandpiper plover. It looks like a sandpiper, but it's a plover. <clears throat> and it lives in those, in bogs, uh, in, on top of mountains, not, not really the top of mountains, but at really high altitude. You can see them over there as well. You can find them in other places along the Andes, but this is a great place to, to try for them. So that was the Northwest. And to finish with this short tour I'm trying to to give you in my country, then it's Patagonia. I, I left this region to, for the end because it's the most different region. I mentioned it uh, before, the birds. Uh, this region is huge. First of all, the name Patagonia doesn't refer to a single habitat, but it's a region where um, an ethnicity used to live, the Patagones or Tehuelche people. That's the reason for the name Patagonia. So it includes uh, different ecoregions, not just, there's no, there's no ecoregion called Patagonia. The Patagonia goes uh, traditionally from this river, the Colorado River, southwards, all the way south. And uh, it, many times the Tierra del Fuego Island is included. Here is where Ushuaia, the southernmost city in the world is, uh, I mean, lays, it's over here. So there are some different ecoregions. It is not the most biodiverse region in the country, but again, most of, the, most of the birds you see there are not found anywhere else in South America. You, you can go from east to west and find first the Atlantic coast, a lot of it, a lot of very long coast with coastal species. And then in the northeast, you can see the Monte Desert. It looks quite green, but this is because the, I shot this picture in springtime. And then in the, if you go further west or south, you get to the Patagonian steppe, which is, it looks very brown because this was this winter. So in winter is darker and duller, I would say. Patagonian steppe. And if you keep going west, you will arrive to the edge of the Patagonian forest, which is in the north of the, of the region. I mean, in northern Patagonia, you get these uh, monkey puzzle trees or Araucaria trees. Uh, you can see in this picture, there are some patches here of green patches. This would be the forest. So it's not all over the place in this, in, in this particular part of, of, the, of, of the region. But if you keep going west, the forest, uh, in, it's lusher and lusher, sorry, um, yeah, it's more lush. <laughs> and you can get to a forest that looks very much like a subtropical or tropical forest. 
Look, this is the Patagonian forest in, a, in an area that is called the Valdivian forest. It's uh, closer to the Pacific. In Patagonia, the winds come from the Pacific, so the humidity comes from the west. Most of it stays in the Chilean side. And then once it's over the Andes, well, it gets to the steppe and, and the desert. So this is the reason why it's uh, so lush, the forest over here. And also you can get some sceneries that are amazing, like, like this glacier, Perito Moreno Glacier. It's, it's in Argentina. It's uh, surrounded by forest. You cannot see it in this, in this picture, but it's impressive. It's really, really impressive, especially if you want to get a glimpse of how the, how the world looked like during the last ice age. This is the most similar thing you can do, or maybe to travel to the Arctic or, or Antarctic. It's really impressive. And it's also impressive that you can get to see this and the um, and Iguazu Falls in one single trip if you want. They're not close and they're not really near, but you can combine both destinations in one trip. And that's also mind blowing, I would say. So birds from east to west in the coast, along the coast, you will find penguins. This is probably, these are probably some of the most attractive species in South America, <clears throat> especially in Patagonia. The most common one is the one in the right here, Magellanic penguin. But we also have a, one colony, breeding colony of Gen 2 penguin in the, in the Beagle Channel near Ushuaia. And that is a colony that has also Magellanic. So this picture is from that place. You can see these two, and sometimes there are even king penguins in that same little island. So if you like penguins or you like to see them and you don't, you can't travel to Antarctica because I don't know, it's too far or too, too expensive. You just can go to Patagonia and see them in a more accessible place. Other birds from the coast are like steamer ducks. Steamer ducks are impressive because they are large, they're big ducks and they're flightless, except for one species, which is called the flying steamer duck. The rest are flightless. And this is an, an this one, the white-headed steamer duck, is an endemic bird of Argentina. It's only found in the coast of Chubut province. Other birds uh, include the sheath bill, the snowy sheath bill, which looks for us, for the Argentinians, it looks like a pigeon. <laughs> and it, you can find it always if you go to a marine mammal colony, let's say sea lion or elephant seal, or another one, fur seal, and you will see them at least one or two, depending on the time of the year. If you are there in, in our, during the winter, there are more of them because they come north from their breeding colonies in Antarctica. But during the summer, there's always, there are some of them at least that stay there all year round. Argentina has lots of pelagic birds, <clears throat> but it's not easy to, to get to see them because our continental shelf is huge. So if you want to get to deep enough water so you can see the areas with a lot of productivity and upwellings and, and all the birds feeding, it's almost impossible. I mean, it's really, really uh, far away. It's over 200 nautical miles to get there. But anyway, from the coast, from the shore, you can, you can sometimes see birds like this, like a black-browed albatross. If you're in Ushuaia, the, in, along the Beagle Channel, you can see them from the coast. Sometimes they're a bit far away, but if you're lucky, they might come closer. Then in the Monte Desert, we have this species, the Barrowing Parakeet, which is almost endemic of Argentina. But it's also impressive because first of all, it's, it's quite pretty and it's large. It's not a macaw, but it's, but it's, it's not a small parakeet, but also the, the breeding colonies of these species in northern Patagonia are the largest breeding colonies of any parrot or parakeet in the world. If you go there at the right time of the year, you can see up to half a million birds. So ha half a million parakeets flying around and they, and they nest uh, on cliffs uh, right uh, against the sea. So it's very impressive to see them, it's beautiful. Then in, also in that Monte Desert, the, this ecoregion is the only, or in fact, it's one of the very few endemic ecoregions. So most of the birds you can see there are endemic to Argentina. So that means 
You can only see them here, like Sandy Galito, which is related to Tapaculos, but this is quite tame. And sometimes if you stay still, they come around you and walk around you and it can even go between your legs <laughs> walking. It's, I really like them. It's one of my favorite birds. Also, Carbonated Sierra Finch is another endemic bird of Argentina that you can find in that uh, type of desert. And if you keep going west, you get to the, uh, the Patagonian steppe and some birds that are attractive from there are include the chocolate vented tyrant, which is also a migrant. Many birds uh, from Patagonia migrate to northern, central and northern Argentina during our winter. But it's always recommended to try to go see them during our summer on their breeding grounds. Other birds include the seed snipes. We have all four seed snipe species uh, in the world. Mm -hmm. They're all South American and we have them all. Least seed snipe is the probably the easiest species to see in the, in the Patagonian steppe uh, during the summer. We have the, the third rhea I mentioned, we have three. <laughs> so lesser rhea or Darwin's rhea is the one you will see in, in Patagonia. Um, <clears throat> and then if you get to some small lakes or not, as, not that small lakes, some lakes, lakes are really big in Patagonia. On the shore, you may see this one, the Magellanic Plover, which is very attractive because also it's the only member of its family. So for people who travel, who like traveling around the world to try seeing all bird families, this is a species they have to come to look for. So they either come to Argentina or to Chile because we share it with, with Chile. And another species, which one of the most attractive species of the country is hooded grebe. It's a beautiful bird. It's a, it's large. I mean, it's not as like a, I don't know what's the name of the large grebe you have in North America, but it's not one of the largest grebes. But it's not also either one of the smallest, but it's, it's beautiful. It has the same plumage all year round. So this is not breeding plumage. They, although this photograph was shot during breeding time, uh, you can see it like this all year round and they are critically endangered. The population is estimated in up to 800 individuals, which is very small, especially for a place like Southern Patagonia that naturally is uh, conditioned by weather. <laughs> like sometimes a volcano explode or there is a, a heavy uh, snow storm. So they need to be more than, eight, more than 800 to, in order to survive in the long term. But well, they are, they're hanging on there. And if you want to see it, this is one of the birds that, that is uh, one of the most attractive birds in the country. We are still moving left, I'm left, sorry, west. <laughs> Now, and get, get into the forest. The Patagonian forest has birds like Magellanic woodpecker, which is the largest uh, woodpecker in South America. It's beautiful and very large. It's also, it's a bit larger than pileated woodpecker so that you can compare it to the one you have there, or probably about, almost about the same size. And some other birds from the forest like Chucao tapaculo. This is a beauty that also it calls a lot. It's much easier to hear than to see, but with some patience, you can you can see it. In this forest, I showed you a picture that looks very much like a rainforest. Well, it is uh, very diverse, but uh, in terms of plants, but not as diverse in terms of birds. But the few birds that you can see there are stunning, like like this. And then you keep going high. I mean, you have we have the Andes on the, in Patagonia as well. And climbing up the mountains, you can see birds like yellow breed, yellow bridled, sorry if I'm not pronouncing it well, finch, which is also endemic to Patagonia and it's beautiful. And then from those mountains, you could see this bird, the Andean condor, which is uh, well, one of the largest birds in the world. It's beautiful and it's, it's amazing to see it. And in Argentina and Chile, you can see you can see them quite easily, even large groups. They have the, the um, distribution range is goes all along the Andes up to Colombia and I think Venezuela, but they are endangered almost everywhere. Very hard to see almost everywhere, except for here in, in, this, in Southern South America. 
in Argentina, there are places where you can go and see them in flocks, like sometimes 20 or 50 or, of them. And it's really, really impressive. So that was all about the birds. Now, if you if you like to visit us, these are just a few advices or tips I'd like to tell you, because maybe you, you, you like the photographs that I showed you and you, you're starting to think, well, maybe I'd, I'd like to visit that country someday. So these are your options. You, you can, there are many ways of, for, of coming, of traveling to Argentina. You can either join the international tour companies, there are many, and the, most of them come to Argentina. So on their group tours, that's an easy way to do it. Or if you like uh, to contact the local birding companies, you can do that. We are quite a few. I mean, I have Birds Argentina is one of them, but there are others and they, they work very well as well. So especially if you're traveling in small groups or as a single traveler, many times it's, it's better to contact the local birding companies than to contact the international, the big ones. Because uh, they do, I mean, when you contact the international, they, they just contact the locals because for one or two passengers, well, it's harder for them to, to, I mean, to, to work that, that kind of tours. Or you just can skip all this and hire local guides. Always it's better to travel, to, to visit a place, hiring local guides for anything you like, not just birding. You'll get to see more than, if, than, than what you would see on your own. And there are, we are many. I mean, I am one of the local guides here. Also, if you don't like uh, hiring any of these, you can make your own journey. Argentina is a country in South America where you can do this. You can camp on your own and, and rent a car. And we have enough infrastructure. We have good roads. Traffic is not as in the States, but it's not the worst traffic in the world. I mean, there are other countries in the region that are harder for if, if you need to to drive a car <clears throat> across a city and there is uh, enough available information in the internet so that you can go to places and travel the way you like and if you're coming you, you should get a field guide and i'd like to recommend you <clears throat> this one which is the field guide right now it's quite new i think it came out last year birds of argentina and Southwest Atlantic. You can find it in, in the States from Princeton Field Guides. And in the UK from, from uh, what's the name? Helm, I think. And it's great. The, the plates uh, are great. I mean, the drawings are amazing, the information. I'm sure you'll like it. And that's always the first, the first thing to do, I recommend when you are planning a trip is to get the field guide so you can just study it, look at the birds you would like to see, <clears throat> and then, well, ask when you contact a local guide or tour company, Company, just ask them where or where should I go if I want to see this or these other species. And okay, so that's, that's it, uh, but wait, I'm sorry, oh, I, it's 10 minutes after eight. I'm really sorry for the, the delay, it took longer than, than what I thought. I hope you're still there. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't yes, we yet. are. Thanks. Um, first, there is a small, a very short video I wanted to show you just as like the end of this. But before going there, if you want to follow any of my of my Instagram accounts, like Birds Argentina, Bird in Buenos Aires, OK, or Natural Birding, here's my contact information for if any of you want to ask me any question of anything i mean it's not this this is not just uh, i mean i like answering questions of any kind you don't need to hire me or to pay me with, to get these answers so if you want just take a picture with your cell phone of this slide and later just contact me and now to share the video i have to stop sharing this screen i think so just a second Stop sharing. And I think you will like this video. That's the reason why I, I, I will try to keep you here three more minutes. The uh, Marcelo, the, the, the strange looking trees that you showed uh, in, in Patagonia. 
the Araucarias, uh, monkey puzzle trees. Those yes. Ones. How how old do they get? Ah, they can get um, two thousand years old. So they are some of the uh, oldest <laughs> living beings here in in the country. Yeah, it's impressive. Wow. We also have we have another species of, of monkey puzzle tree in the Paraná forest, but that is a fast growing species, so it doesn't live that much, that long. So now to, I'm just about to share the video, share video here. <clears throat> Think. Now before it starts, I just wanted to tell you this is a video I helped to create when I was working at the local partner of BirdLife International. And it's part of, a, of an official, um, what do you call it, um, advertising spot of Argentina as a birding destination. We called it... Okay, after video, I said that I hope this video and my talk will gave you an idea of what to expect if, if you're ever coming to Argentina for birding or if you just wanted to know what it's like birding in Argentina. And also I said that if you ever um, make a, a lecture like this, but about the birds of your region, I would love to attend it. So please invite me. Uh, I have a yeah. question. Do, yes. do you um, 
where are the bird birding trips you lead? I mean, because you can't lead a trip all over the whole entire country, right? Well, I do lead trees uh, trips, sorry, all over all over the country, but mainly yeah. as a, yes, I, I mainly guide here in Buenos Aires and surrounding as a local guide, okay. but then I also guide in all of Argentina, especially as a tour leader. So many times when you have a group like like a sort of large group. So the tour leader is the one who is all the time with the group. And then we visit spots and have local guides in places where there are local guides. Because some regions of Argentina still don't have enough uh, local guides. So I also guide as almost as a local in those places. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was an awesome video. Really, really fun. Really inspiring. Great. And I'm glad you liked it. We were very happy with it when we made it. I think it's all, already six years old, probably five years old. But yeah, we were very happy with it. Marcelo, I have a question about the Yungas forest that you were talking about. Because, um, yeah, is it, would you describe it as the foothills of the Andes, sort of the beginning of the Andes? Or... Um, or it's, uh, are, 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 are they really separate? Is, um... Well, it's um, there's, I mean, the Andes at that uh, part of, of South America, it's separated in different ranges. There's not just one range, like with the uh, high, high mountains and, and then two lowlands and to the west and to the right. So the Andes over there starts over there. We call it, usually we call it the sub, sub Andean mountains. And then you get to the Puna Plains, and then you have the other another range of the Andes where usually the highest mountains are located. So, but it's part of part of the same. Uh, what's the, the name of it? When the Andes started to lift up, well, they moved all of that. So even if it's not the, maybe that mountain specific mountain is maybe it's not considered the true Andes. It's part of the Andes range. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the Yungas forest goes up into Bolivia. But that's pretty much it, right? Because I think there are many species also that you could only see in Bolivia or in Argentina. And that's pretty much it. Yes. Um, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's connected to other forests. I mean, in Bolivia, where that, and that kind of forest ends, another forest begins. It's where there's an, it's usually called the elbow of the Andes. If you see the shape of the Andes, in, at some point in Bolivia, it, it starts uh, there, its way down, like from north to south. But before that point, it goes from west to east. Mm -hmm. So that's where the Andes change and also the forest change and it gets more tropical. So from that part of Bolivia, northwards or westwards, you get uh, Quetzals, you get the uh, Cock of the Rock, you get um, Andean like uh, mountain toucans, Birds that we don't get in Argentina, mm. but yeah, that's where where it ends. Mm. Any other question? Have Have any of you uh, been uh, in Argentina or or in South America? Yes, yeah, so I've been to Argentina. I think in two thousand four. And yeah, I was fortunate to be in a small group and was able to go not all the places you showed, but uh, through Patagonia, especially. Uh, it's a really special experience. Great. Great. Yes, I, I'm, I'm glad you, you, you liked it. Also, I forgot to say, I was going to say it at the beginning. I, should, I just showed you a few of the most at, attractive destinations in the country, but there are many others. Just there's not enough time for them, for all of them. But there are many other places in Argentina you can visit, like Cordoba, the central part of Argentina, uh, the Chaco in other areas. Well, it's either. Yeah. Anyone else? I was in Brazil. Oh, great. That's many years ago, though. In southern Brazil or the Pantanal or yes, the Pantanal 
and oh, nice. um, uh, Rio de Janeiro, of course, where you start. Um, and we did go to Iguazu. Ah, great, in the Brazilian side. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. Great. In the video, you, 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 you probably saw that there are birds that live in on the cliffs of the same, like, like yeah. underneath the oh, the falls. Those, those are great dusky swifts. Dusky so swift. that they nest over there. It's impressive to see them. Also, one thing, you know, interesting thing in Argentina is that we have we have swifts, but they are in, in mountain areas. So when you arrive in, Ar in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, we don't have any swift. I tell you this because many times the, my own passengers, when they arrive and they meet me, they, they, they saw a swift in the, in the airport, but there were swallows or martins. It's uh, interesting also how, how the birds change from place to place. Also in South America, we don't have crows or ravens. Instead of them, we have many vultures. And, and here in Southern South America, we have lots of caracaras. So no crows, but we have crested caracaras outside here in, <laughs> in the square. That could be interesting for you. Okay. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, yeah. So when you travel around from place to place, like if you're traveling, say, from Buenos Aires with a group to uh, Patagonia or some other eco region do you travel by plane or by bus or how do you get from region to region well it it depends i like traveling by plane and uh, i either rent a car or a truck in, in the destination or i many times i work together with local guides who also drive sometimes they are i mean they are local guys they know very well the roads and places but they maybe they don't speak uh, good enough uh, English or they don't know all the birds. So we, we build up a team and it's, it's nice because then I think those are the best trips because they know places, they know where to look for the birds and I, I know how to find them. <laughs> but sometimes if the destinations are not far, uh, really, really far, we, we just drive. I think this has been being such a long country, big, but especially long from north to south. I think it's better to to fly from 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 region to region and then drive around in each destination. And what size are the groups that you usually deal with? Well, usually I like small groups. When I am the one that, who organizes the trip, usually my the the largest group I like, I would like to have is six to eight. I mean, if it was for me, I would have even smaller groups, especially depending on the um, on the, the type of habitat. Because if you are in the thick forest, then even six is a big group. But when I am uh, hired as a tour leader for the, for other companies, I think the largest groups I had were ten or around ten people. And is the, are there certain times of year that are uh, are better for traveling or for the group? <clears throat> yes, yeah, but that depends also on the destination. Like, um, especially if you if you want to go to Patagonia, the best is to go during our summer because the weather is better, and also many species are there during the summer. And then in winter, they travel to other places. There are some. There are a few sec a few exceptions, like this winter, I mean, South American winter, uh, Southern Hemisphere's winter, I took advantage of my free time and I traveled, I visited Southern Patagonia to look for the hooded grebes on their wintering areas uh, because they are easier to see there than in their summer, like breeding grounds. The, all the, the logistics are much easier than if you, if you have to go to the lakes where they breed and also, they every year they choose a different lake or lagoon, so you might go to a lake and they're not there. But during the winter, they all gather in the estuaries of a few rivers of Patagonia, in the Atlantic coast. So if you go there in winter, you have better chances. So there are exceptions. I would recommend Patagonia in the summer, but if you want to see the hooded grebe, maybe it's better to go in winter. And then the north, it depends also. The summer can be good in the northwest up until 
February, I mean, Austral summer until February, because then March is the rainy season. So it could be dangerous as well, or you might not get to the places you want to get because of the, the road could be could be uh, blocked. So yeah, it's uh, it depends on what you would like to see. And last question: If you go to say Patagonia in the uh, winter time, uh, what are your chances of seeing the Southern Lights, the Aurora Australis? Oh, sadly for us, we are very far away from that. In mm. fact, I mean, compared to uh, the Northern Hemisphere, we are not as far south as you are north. Right. <laughs> like um, in Europe, also in North America, you can be in, in, in this uh, Arctic Circle in the continent. Well, it doesn't, that doesn't happen in South America. And even if you go to Antarctica, you might be uh, walking in the Antarctic Peninsula and not being south enough to be inside the, the Antarctic circle. Right. So yeah, we're far away. No, I would love to have those lights here, but no. Okay. We don't. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? If not, well, I mean, I'm. I love answering questions. <laughs> but let's say if you if you don't have a question now, but you have you think of one later, and if you have my contact information, please just write me, uh, send me a, a message, or. And if if or, you don't, you could contact Rich or myself. We both have exactly. um, Marcelo's contact information. So great, great job tonight, Marcelo. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And I'm sorry again for having, I mean, it's already half past eight for you. So, but I hope this uh, extra time was interesting for you as well. Yes, very much so. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. No, I just wanted to do it. Oh, perfect. Thank Marcelo for a fascinating program. We really appreciate the time and the effort you put into putting this together for us. And I think uh, those of us who didn't know much about the extraordinary bird life in Argentina are just blown away by it. We're just amazed at, at the gorgeous and incredibly diverse bird life in your nation. And uh, thank you so much for sharing that with us. It was a great evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. <laughs>